Hi all, my name is Zbigniew Mikulski of the La Jolla Institute and today we are celebrating because QPAD 0.4 is soon to be released. So today I will try to show you how I start to work with images in QPAD. We're going to focus on visualization of your data in this powerful software. So before we jump into QPAD, let's talk a little bit about the resources that are available to you to learn more about bioimage analysis. And this is a fantastic introduction. Um, it really goes into a lot of very interesting details from Pete Bankett. Um, if you want to get a much greater understanding of the topics covered in this video, I highly recommend spending a few minutes and reading through the chapter Introducing Images, um, because we're going to be talking about images and pixels and lookup tables and um, you know it all will make a lot more sense if you will get the chance to read through this very um, nicely written and accessible um, introduction to um, uh, images. Um, we will be talking a lot about um, um, histograms today so if you're not familiar with the topic of a histogram uh, please have a look at this awesome book. Um, there will be also um, some talk about the uh, bit depth of your images and um, um, that's also a very helpful uh, primer on, into that, um, uh, that topic. And uh, we will be covering um, some ground on the lookup tables and different ways to visualize your data. So having a bit of understanding of how those images are um, created in your computer or how they are stored is very helpful indeed. We will be using some of the images that are um, available online such as the, um, the Luca 7 color image to demonstrate some multiplexing capability of data visualization in QPath. I also highly recommend um, that you visit um, image.sc uh, forum because there is plenty of information um, about how to use QPath in practice. Um, there is also this great website from uh, Mike Nelson, imagescientist.com, where you can have a look at um, um, a lot of very helpful um, contributions to this project that Mike uh, provided. So when we start working with QPath, we always want to start with creating a project. To do that, I will create a new folder and I will name it as something informative so I can find it more easily. And by dragging this into open QPath window, I will create project for this empty directory. That directory needs to be empty because QPath wants to be able to overwrite anything it finds there. Okay, let's start by working on our first image. I'm gonna gra drag this um, image of um, uh, gut from the mouse that was stained with h &E. And for the sake of argument, I'm just going to use the default um, settings. Now this image appears here in my image list under the projects tab. If I double click on that, I will see the image now opened in my viewer window and I will be greeted with that um, with that uh, pop-up window that prompts me to set up an image type. And um, QPath can do different things depending on the image types. So it is helpful to, um, if we know what the image type is, um, go ahead and set it up. I will, just for the sake of argument today, not set the image type. So I wanted to show you that you can open this window called brightness and contrast and you can see that this indeed is an RGB image composed of red, green, and blue channels. I can click on them and um, by combining those colors, we get back more or less to the original. So um, I know that this image is H&E and actually changing the image type would allow me to do a lot more in QPath. So if I go to image, um, 
there's some information about the pixel types that, that we have here, some information about the size of the pixels. And um, I have image type not set. I will double click that and set it as H and E. So now the software actually did something very smart in the background. It knows that there is an hematoxin and eosin to be expected. And now if I go to this brightness and contrast panel, um, in addition to the old channels, colors that I had, I now also have access to unmixed hematoxylin and eosin channel. Okay, so let's have a closer look at this image. I'm going to maximize my window and I can resize this a little bit so I can have um, a better view of that. So the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to be able to zoom in into that image and have a look at some details. Um, the best way to do that is to have a mouse with a mouse wheel. And then um, I will also get that little help, the input display. That will show us whether I'm clicking the left mouse button or the right mouse button and any kind of um, shortcuts on the keyboard that I'm using. Okay, so I'm going to use my mouse zoom, uh, my mouse wheel to zoom in into the um, into the data. And um, we can explore the sample for a little bit. And you know, the one thing that I would like to know a little bit more is what are those cells here? And um, you know, with this particular H and E stain, it's a little bit hard to tell. They tend to be very dark. Now I can go back to my brightness and contrast window. And I could try to change the max display to make an image that's a lot brighter. And that works, but it's not very satisfactory, right? Um, it makes everything bright, but it's, it's kind of too bright. So there is another way to change the way how QPath is displaying your data. And that's called gamma. So if you're familiar with gamma correction, that's great. Um, there are lots of people that are afraid of using it um, because it is a non-linear adjustment. However, um, when used as a display only tool, it is very powerful. So I will click on this little gear icon and that will allow me to set the preferences to customize Cupid's appearance and behavior. And in this little window, I will start to type in gamma. And by changing my gamma value to a lower value, I'm going to be able to actually kind of brighten up the image in a nonlinear way. And that's exactly what I what I want. And now I can see the cytosol of these cells um, to a much better degree than before. Now everything is kind of easier to read. And um, our eyes are not linear. They have a gamma of about 0.4. Um, the cameras in the microscopy systems that we're using are hopefully linear with a gamma of about one. What gamma is supposed to do is to provide you with some kind of correction. So when you're looking at your sample through the microscope and then the sample is scanned through a digital scanner, for example, those images do not look alike. And gamma is one of the ways how you can make them to look a little bit more similar. Now this is changing only your display, it does not change your underlying data. Okay, so um, different images may require different gamma correction. It is important to know that because this is in preferences of the software, if we would now switch to a different image type, um, that gamma um, will be there. So if you're um, unsure about that, um, you know, just changing back to one um, before moving to a different image. However, I really like um, much more um, how this image looks when I change this gamma a little bit. It's much more useful to me. Um, so some of these cells are probably plasma cells. Um, there are also some neutrophils 
um, potentially. Um, and this is a, an inflammatory model in a mouse intestine. The other thing that I would really like to do is, uh, I kind of keep tilting my head in one way um, because this image is tilted, so I can go to view, rotate image, and I can rotate this image like that. Now this is also a global setting, so if you go to a different image, it's also gonna be rotated. So keep that in mind, please. Now I would like to show you that there is this window here that shows you where you are in the sample. So if you're browsing and looking around, you can easily um, understand where you are based on this red rectangle. There is also this portion here, and this is a very, um, very um, um, helpful uh, tool that we're gonna explore in when we are looking at um, fluorescence data a little bit more. There is also a scale bar uh, shown here in the bottom left. Okay, so let's explore some other tools that are available in QPath. Um, we can get a mini viewer that's helpful to, you know, look at the details of the areas that we're exploring here. So let's explore some options of taking screenshots and snapshots of your data. I can do that by going to File, Export Snapshot, and we have a couple of options, and each of them is useful. Main Window Screenshot will give you a literal screenshot of the window, so if you have a mini viewer open or this little guy open, they will be um, included in the image. That's a Main Window um, content, so that includes everything, but without the overlaying um, mini viewers and such. And then there is current viewer content, and that's what's right here underneath. Okay, so we're gonna give it a try, and you can see the, um, the difference in a moment. Okay, so here is the window screenshot. We have the viewers that overlay the window. We have the content of the window and we have the content of the viewer itself. The last option is for vector graphics um, and we're not gonna get into that today. Great. So now let's move to a different image, this lung image. And as I mentioned, Rotation is transferred between images. So in this case, we're probably gonna want to go back to zero rotation. And with gamma one again, um, this PS stain that we see here is not visible in a very nice way. And the goal of visualization is to, is to just make it easier for us to see um, what we're dealing with so we can quantify it more easily later on. And that's again where gamma um, changing gamma value can help. Let's move to a fluorescence data. This is a um, piece of spleen that has been stained with smooth muscle lactin. And, um, and there is a lot of autofluorescence in this tissue. And there is also some nuclear labeling with a host. So I will like to explore those channels one by one and work on those histograms here um, and the min and max display values to optimize the image so I can see um, um, certain features that are in this image a little bit better. So first of all, let's change the names of those things. Um, I can double check on the channel properties and type in the name that I want to give it. And as you can see, I can also change the channel color by clicking on this and selecting something else. This image has three channels and the 
keys on your keyboard, one, two, three, will switch on and off those individual channels. That's very useful when you're dealing with uh, multiplex data. And the same applies to your unmixed and, and the H and E channel uh, image. There's probably not a single right way to do image analysis. There are many ways to get it wrong. Um, and we are at least trying to get it not horribly wrong. Okay. So it turns out that green and red are particularly unfriendly to a lot of people. I created a little video that uh, shows you how um, others can perceive different combinations of colors. And there is also this fascinating way how our visual system processes the information depending on the color context. So um, we are most sensitive to grayscale, but um, there are certain colors that um, will make um, it more difficult uh, for you to see the detail, whereas there are some colors that, um, you know, um, allow you to see uh, more. But again, grayscale is the most sensitive for us. Okay, so let's dive in and let's explore the min and max display. So by selecting the channel that I want to work on and dragging it inwards, I'm going to make the channel brighter. And by doing it this way, I'm going to make it dimmer. Now, it goes only to a certain value here. And uh, if I double click on that, I can actually set my display range to a, a, a new maximum. Um, the image that I have here is in a 16 bit depth format. So it has um, values from zero to a little bit over 65,000. So now I can, I can go back and readjust this. And my goal is um, if I want to show different structures here, um, it would really help me if I don't have too many points that are, um, you know, completely oversaturated like this, right? That doesn't really help. It, um, it makes it difficult to see. However, when I'm zooming out all the way, um, that image now is becoming a little bit too dim and I don't really see too many details. So, um, the correct setting um, depends a little bit on the context and there is no one way to do it right. There is lots of ways to do it wrong, unfortunately, at the end. And this is a visualization, right? This is supposed to help you and your and the reviewer, the, the viewer of your, of your research to um, understand better what you're trying to convey. So I like this example because there is this very intensive and bright capsule. Um, some blood vessels here and there, but there are also those follicles that um, um, are places where a lot of immune cells hang out. Um, they're much denser than the surrounding white uh, red pulp. Um, and um, that's another, another case where um, if I wanted to show in one picture, in one image, um, the details of those structures here that are now completely, completely uh, overblown and the details of the structures here, um, it's actually very difficult to do it on a linear scale. And uh, gamma as a nonlinear correction again comes in handy uh, because we can um, change the gamma and then um, we can essentially still be able to see those structures here and be able to see the structures um, in these regions of the tissue. However, with most of my immunofluorescence data sets, I'm just going to be working with gamma of one. And I'm actually going to be using this brightness and contrast a lot because I may need to um, adjust it uh, on the fly as I'm um, working through my images. And there is one more thing that I want to tell you your images are never going to be perfect. There's always going to be background. Biology doesn't want to collaborate. Of course, you need to strive for technical excellence and understanding of what you've got. But um, I would like to 
convey that message that um, um, you know cleaning up your signal by for example um, changing this so you kind of binarize your image and you only show the good thing right the 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 stuff that's so bright that it must be right um, can lead you to a very false conclusion that there is no smooth muscle acting elsewhere um, in the spleen and that would be dangerous so let's normalize the fact that um, our images are not perfect and let's also normalize the fact that we need controls in order to be able to see what is real and what's not so let's look at this more complex image the luca 7 color um, we have a lot of going on here um, let's bring our brightness and contrast so we can look at it one by one um, i'm gonna start by um, highlighting everything and then with my control key uh, down i'm going to deselect the ck side the keratin channel i'm going to right click and i'm going to hide everything that's selected um, this is very helpful if you're dealing with a higher number of channels so i'm always surprised by the number of ways how you can get something done in cupat and uh, doing those videos is fun because i keep reminding myself about them so um we are looking at the cytokeratin channel now. We can add in the DAPI channel. And um, this image has been pretty well balanced already. Um, but I, what I wanted to show you is the difference in the pixel values that we have here. And when you compare it to the, to the other image that we were looking at, um, that, those, those values were in thousands. And these are intense. Okay, so different data sets can have very different scales. And um, by using your histogram, you can actually see um, a little bit better what's going on. Um, this is showing you the max value of just 34. So um, by going through um, those channels one by one, um, we can appreciate um, the signal in all of those different channels. Um, probably adjust it a little bit more Fox B3 cells have this nuclear staining pattern CD8 is predominantly on the membrane PDL1 and PD1 are shown here and then we have a very nice cytokeratin so one very useful um, tool in QPath is a channel viewer. This tool allows you to um, look at individual um, channels while you're browsing a bigger data set. And you can right click on this, change the zoom level. So if you want to see a very magnified image when you're looking from far away, that's one way to use it. Or you can have an overview image when you're zooming in. Uh, many different ways to, um, to use a tool, of course. So there is one extra super useful tool that I use very often, and that's MultiView. I will close this viewer and I will add a column. So now I have two viewers and I'm gonna select my left viewer. I'm gonna double click on this image. That's an H and E. And I'm gonna double click, I'm gonna click on this viewer and double click on this image. That's a Pico Sirius red uh, with fast green. So this is a this is the same tissue actually um, that has been first stained for H and E and then stained for Pico Sirius Red after some destaining. And what's great about this is that now I can explore those tissues together. I made this tissue a little bit larger than this one, so I can show you how I can work with um, manual alignment. First of all, I'm gonna right click 
on multi view and I'm going to unsynchronize my viewers. And then I'm going to match viewer resolution. So then I will move this to and I'm going to use my my edge of my window as my um, alignment guide. I'm going to do the same with this one. And then I can go back and synchronize my viewers again. And now um, whenever I move one window, the other window follows. And um, um, it's, um, it's usually um, retaining that synchronization over a quite large uh, area of the tissue. Um, this also works great for images that are of different types, such as, um, you know, an H&E and a fluorescence image corresponding to this sample. Um, I have a short video showing the difference between the second harmonic generation that's taken on a 2000 microscope and the same sample scanned on the slide scanner um, that I will try to link somewhere here. We're going to close this viewer and we're going to close this viewer and then I can remove one of those columns. Cubot, of course, is a lot more than just a viewer and you're going to be using a lot of annotation tools to highlight landmarks, areas of interest um, and that's going to be often basis for your subsequent analysis. So let's try to explore some of the tools for um, annotating. We can use rectangles we can use ovals or ellipses. Holding shift is going to make it equidistant. Um, we have lines. And um, we also have brush tool that allows you to kind of color in an area. We also have one tool, which is a super useful tool. Um, just going to show you how quickly we can um, highlight those follicles. If we made a mistake, we can, I like to do my corrections with the brush tool. I want to alter that annotation. So I'm going to hit my alt, hold it, and then I can clean it up. Uh, and in this case, I would like to fill in that edge a little bit more. Okay, so by clicking on the line, right, we can see now that this is a length of 300 microns. And if I want to know what's the area of this hole here. I can click my one tool and I can click quickly estimate that to be um, about 18,000 microns squared. So let me remove all of those annotations and create a new one over that follicle. Be holding Alt key to alter it a little bit. Whoopsie. Can delete that and start over. I can right click on it and set properties, or I can select it and hit enter, and I can name it. And that now appears here. That is a length of 256. Similarly, hitting enter. There's another super useful way how you're going to be working with annotations, and that's by um, classifying them into different regions. So in this case, what I would like to do is I would like to create a class called white pulp.
and I can give it a distinct color. Let's make it red. And I'm going to create another um, class called red pulp. And to confuse everyone, I'm going to uh, make it white. No, I'm just kidding. I'm actually going to go and do this and do that. Okay. So I happen to know that my red pulp is the stuff that's not so dense right here. And um, I'm probably going to be having the easiest time annotating this with um, this DAPI view or this DNA view. It's actually hex, not, not DAPI. I'm going to make it a little brighter so it's a little bit easier for me to see. And then I can either use a one tool or or this brush tool. I'm just going to create a few annotations here and I can set this class to white pulp. Now I have one white pulp annotation, another white pulp annotation set class. I can also auto set this. So whenever I'm creating a new annotation, I will automatically assign a class to it. I want to remember to deselect auto set after this is done. And now let's try to work on the on the red pulp. And now let's try to work on the red pulp. So by holding Ctrl and Shift, I can have Cupid avoid my previous annotations. So this should also work with the one tool. And now we have one annotation for the red pulp and a few annotations for the white pulp. Wow, this time is flying. So when you're working with your annotations, you sometimes you might want to hide them. And you can do that by clicking on that button, show and hide annotations. You can also make them more opaque by using the slider. So, you know, if you are working on something and suddenly you know you don't see the annotations it's very likely that you have them hidden uh, through this button or through the slider the same goes with cell detections and um, uh, classifications and things like that but um, but that is a, a story for a completely new video projects in Cupid are very portable so you can take the project folder and you can move it to a different computer. And as long as you have access to your original files, um, you can um, actually open up this, um, this project. And if you did not transfer the files together with your project or the path to them is different on that different drive, for example, 
um, Qpath will um, tell you that some of the files might have been deleted or moved. And we will search for um, for our data. I happen to have mine on the desktop and in the, the demo folder. And I just need to point to Qpath the folder that contains my files and don't really have to drill down um, to find them. And automatically they have all been found. We will apply changes. And now I can um, go back into, into my project and all of my work has been uh, preserved. Thank you very much. I hope it was somewhat useful for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at the Images C forum. Thanks. Bye.